welcome to the, everyone to the greatest podcast in the world until we actually figure out a, a name. But in, until we do that, we're just the greatest podcast in the world. So today I got my my partner. We got uh, Alex and of course his, his girlfriend Maria, who is uh, Puerto Rican. And we have Maria's best friend Marisol. Maria will will introduce her. Hi guys. Um, Marisol works in the U.S. Navy as a naval officer. She was born and raised in Puerto Rico. She studied law in the University of Puerto Rico in Rio Piedras. And we decided to invite her because we are going to be talking today about how to redefine Puerto Rico and the options that we have and the solutions and the problems and all about Gringo Go Home movement that it's against progress in Puerto Rico. Yeah, well, th yeah, thanks, Marisol, for, for joining us. So, I mean, where do you want to start? Do you just want to jump right into the into the video that um, Alex and Maria were talking about with the, the documentary from Bianca? Yeah, I think that uh, I personally wasn't aware of the Gringo Go Home movement until Bianca released this video and Alex and Maria decided to show it to me. And I had um, very strong reactions to it. So let's start with this part. They're displacing native Puerto Ricans. With the famous 30-day notice letter that asks us to leave. And now where do I go? What if they charge me over there something I can't pay? There are big economic interests at play. And it's going on in all of Puerto Rico. We'll be foreigners in our own land. We must organize, ma'am. Because when those below move, those above come tumbling down. This is Puerto Rico. But life here isn't the same for everyone. Some arrive with advantages and benefits, and some have been here forever and are now feeling displaced and take away what belongs to them. But there are also those who created these conditions and those who hold the power to change them. So Marisol, from your perspective, what, what did you see there? Well, I think it's interesting because Puerto Rico has been a country of immigrants for decades. Uh, Hispanics from Spain immigrated decades ago. Um, the African nation that was brought as slaves, they were immigrants as well. And we adopted a lot of things from their culture into the Puerto Rican culture. And we're very proud of that. There's also a, a very large Asian community there's a large Middle Eastern community in Puerto Rico. And all these communities have gone to Puerto Rico to contribute positively to the economy and to our culture. I am saddened by the fact that Puerto Ricans don't understand and value the fact that Americans from the continental US are also immigrants that have decided to choose our island as a place to establish themselves, establish their businesses, and I do think that a great majority of the Americans that go to Puerto Rico want to contribute positively to the island. Now, there's no doubt that as a business person, you do want to exploit resources and you do want to take advantage in a certain way for the profit of your business. But there is a reality. These businesses that do go to Puerto Rico are creating jobs, are creating an economy that without them, I don't know where Puerto Rico would be right now. Yeah, well, isn't it true, though, that Mar not you, Marisol, but Bianca, she hasn't really offered a solution to any of the problems. She's only offered a problem over and over and over. It's the same problem every time. It's, you know, that real estate is going up, it's causing gentrification, that it's Gringo Go Home fault, the beaches are being exploited, which I absolutely agree with, that politicians are being paid off, and all of those things are causing social issues, but not once has there ever been a solution. And I feel that the real end game for her is to get likes and views and to get comments and to get engagement. And it's worked for her, right? She's now with Bad Bunny. She's on, got, you know, mentioned on Saturday Night Live. And her post today was about, look, I made it. I left being a reporter after going to college in Syracuse. I'm a storyteller. I'm telling a narrative. I'm an influencer online. It's not really about showing technical competence about a different idea. And I want to make something clear. I actually support the independent party. There's a magic here in Puerto Rico that it may be a territory of the United States, but it's its own beautiful thing. And there's so much talent that comes out of this island. 
And really, I feel that it should be independent. But I don't think that Bianca, being the storyteller that she is, is building the right narrative for Puerto Rico to get there. Yeah, I would agree that it's not the right narrative. I think that throughout Central America, throughout Asia, a lot of countries that are similar to our own, which are island countries typically, but um, in Central America, countries that are second world in nature, they exploit external capital that wants to come in and wants to establish businesses. They also have very elaborate retirement programs because they want to bring retirees, which the majority are from the US that go and retire and they spend their money in these countries and they get the benefit of being able to live in a place where the cost of living isn't as high as in the US. So throughout the world, we see how this occurs in all types of different nations. And there is a culture in Puerto Rico to reject anything that comes from the United States, specifically from this sector that wants Puerto Rico to be independent. But I think that their passion for the independence of Puerto Rico blinds them to the fact that there is a benefit to have external capital coming in and funding programs, funding projects that we internally cannot fund. You know, there are so many buildings that are abandoned and that causes problems. It can cause disease problems. It can cause problems of criminality. And these buildings have been abandoned for decades, much earlier than Maria. There have been plenty of abandoned buildings that no one wants to restore, or maybe no one has the funds to restore, or no one has the vision to exploit these buildings. How are we going to get mad at someone that comes from the exterior and sees a value in what we have and says, I want to purchase this and I wanna put it into productivity. And I understand that one of her criticisms is that a lot of these buildings create jobs that are low paying jobs. Well, maybe that's the conversation that we need to have. Maybe we need to increase the, the income salary, the minimum wage, and that way, if you are a worker of a Airbnb and you're cleaning, that you can get eight to $10 an hour instead of getting whatever it is that they're getting paid now. But I think it's a convenient flag to hold that all the problems of Puerto Rico are caused by the gringos that have come in after Maria, because that's just not the reality. Mm -hmm. Maria, what do you think about the first part of the video? She was showing an immigrant, right, that was from the Dominican Republic, right? So what's the difference between somebody from the Dominican Republic or somebody from Florida coming to Puerto Rico? The reality is there, there's no difference. It's someone that is not born and raised in Puerto Rico, comes to Puerto Rico because they see an opportunity to grow and they move here with the dream because we are the part of the US with the dream, the American dream. Have your own thing, have your own business, make money, help your family and do all that. So one of my first problems with this video is that we are saying and we are attacking gringos for coming to this island and your first person that you're interviewing because is getting um, a letter. Sympathy. To yeah, get sympathy to someone that is not really a Puerto Rican. And you are building this um, speech or building this narrative of hate towards gringos when I know a lot of Puerto Ricans that basically don't like Dominicans. So you opening a documentary about Puerto Rico and how Puerto Ricans are being affected and opening that with a Dominican, it's a little bit weird to me. Why, why can't, couldn't you find a Puerto Rican to do your first set of your documentary? And also this person has been living, it's not to say nothing bad, but it's been living there for 26 years. Okay. Like someone bought the building. They, it's, it's business. Someone comes here by the by the building and pretends to do profits. So yes, it's bad that you have thirty days to leave your house and live 
and look for somewhere somewhere to live, but it's business. They're giving you 30 days. They could say, you have to leave today because I just bought the building and the building is mine. So for me, it's kind of weird how that started. Yeah. yeah I'm just kind of curious for, for you, Maria and Marisol, like, you know, I lived in Costa Rica and in other countries in South America. And I, I find the word gringo to be interesting because like when I was in like Costa Rica, for example, they define gringo as anyone that's from America any white person from America, yeah. if you're a white person from Europe, even though like the Europeans, you know, spe- you know, specifically the Spanish, they settled most of Latin America. They don't consider them to be gringos. It's only the, you know, the people from America. So like, what is exactly even a gringo to begin with? Like gringo go home. I mean, what exactly does that even entail to even begin the question, I guess, for me? Well, the historical context of the word is that during the war between the United States and Mexico, the Mexican soldiers began to call the U.S. soldiers green go because their uniform was green and they wanted them to go. So that's why specifically that word has been utilized to describe U.S. citizens from the mainland. Um, But regarding... European influence, etc. I think that there is a historical pain that Latin America has and the Caribbean has against the United States because that the reality is that the United States has been one of the most powerful countries, but also one of the major colonizers in the past century. And because of that pain of the political relationships that the U.S. has had with Latin America and the Caribbean, there is a hate towards the U.S. and how they do politics and how they do business between countries. And I want to touch on that word colonizer for a second and gringo, because gringo wasn't a slur, but it's becoming like a slur. Colonizer is definitely a slur. And, you know, I understand the pain of what has happened in the last five centuries. The atrocities that have happened are horrible. They've really been put on European Americans but humans are the apex predator on the planet. And they have been assholes to one another since the beginning. You know, the number one group that has actually won the most wars and had the most killing is the Asian community, right? And they, if you look that up, they're number one, they've done it. But we never talk about the colonization that they've done, right? We only talk about the colonization that's happened with European Americans. And I'm not condoning it. It's absolutely terrible. It's just that none of us have anything to do with what happened five centuries ago. We're here living in the present moment, dealing with present day problems. But if you look at the first colonizer of Puerto Rico, because I really wanted to understand the history, it was God, right? There was nobody here, right? It was his island for humans, for earthlings. And then you had the Casimiroid people that came up through the Antilles, then the Ortoroid people that came up through the Antilles that eliminated the Casimiroids, then the Caroso people that eliminated the Ortoroids, And then you had the Arawak Indians that came in and they became the Tainos and they eliminated the Caroso. So you had four generations of immigrants before the Spaniards ever got here. But that narrative is never told. We're just told that the Spaniards are the ones that colonized. And again, the things that happened are absolutely horrible, but Native Americans were battling for land as well. That's part of history. And that's part of history that's not spoken about. You know, now that we're here in the present moment, We've got to find a way to be able to work together and not repeat the past that we're living in today. And so the word colonizer really shows that someone is uneducated because they are not sharing the entire story from the beginning of time. Well, I I tend to disagree with your perception of the word colonizer. I think Mm -hmm. that it's not a slur. It's just a reality. You know, a Mm -hmm. colonizer. A nation that colonizes another nation is a nation that is more powerful than the other one and takes advantage of its resources in an unequal relationship. And throughout history, Britain has been one of the main colonizers as well. And there is a lot of resentment in the countries that Britain colonized because of the abuse that they endured. And similarly, the U.S. colonized Puerto Rico in 1898, and there was a lot of things that the U.S. government did. To name a few, they 
utilize Puerto Ricans for cancer research and they utilized Puerto Ricans as guinea pigs and they radiated them. They utilize prisoners, they utilize women for research for birth controls and many women reported to be infertile after that. So there is pain and these people aren't people that are, not all of them are dead. There's people that are still alive that went through this. Um, in the 1930s, Spanish was outlawed in public schools and you could only speak English in public schools. So a lot of people stopped sending their kids to school because their kids were frustrated because they didn't understand the language. So these attacks to us as human beings and us as a culture, because you need to understand, yes, Spain did colonize Puerto Rico, but after a certain amount of time, the African, the Taino and the Spanish people mixed together and they became Puerto Ricans. They became a national identity. And at that point, historically is where we start with the fact that the US came in and wanted to take that away from Puerto Ricans as a whole. And that is where the pain is coming from. So to call the United States a colonizer, it is a reality. We do not have an equal relationship with the United States. We need to go beg to Congress for anything that we receive. And we mm -hmm. do not have representation that is equal. So there is pain in the relationship that we have the, with the US. I think that we do have to separate things, right? Because you, Alex, or you, Jesse, didn't come personally and call I've never been on a boat. I never carried a musket. I never- Absolutely, you know I mean? absolutely. Like, and, and I think that's where I empathize with the US citizens from the mainland that move. And I want to emphasize US citizens because the reality is, we're all Americans from Canada down to uh, Argentina and Puerto Ricans are US citizens. The difference is that we don't live in the mainland. So people that come from the mainland to live in Puerto Rico did not colonize us. But what brings up the pain for a lot of people is the fact that there are resources that we have not been able to exploit ourselves because the government puts a thousand boundaries for them or because we don't have the financial resources to them. And there is some type of pain when you see that someone else is being able to exploit them. And yeah. I can understand that. My issue is that if it's for the betterment of Puerto Rico, I can look past the fact that certain properties aren't owned by Puerto Ricans anymore, because ultimately we are getting a trickle down benefit. And I think that that's where I wish the Gringo Go Home movement would understand that in certain circumstances, you do need external capital to move a country forward. And in our case, just look at the power infrastructure. If we had an actual competitive process where a power company would come in and compete and be transparent with that competition and they would completely restore our power grid, the country would be completely different. Mm -hmm. But we're fighting Luma and we're fighting the government and I don't see someone actually bringing forward solutions. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not really about solutions. It's about a niche that's making Bianca rich, right? She preaches the same problem over and over and over and you have to be outrageous to get likes and views and comments and outrage marketing as the number one thing to create engagement and do it. And she's done it, congratulations. But it's a manipulation of our own people to support her Patreon, her fame, and what's going on with it. And a real solution to the problem would be to educate people that come to the island. You have to be a student of the culture, right? You have to be compassionate about the history and you have to make sure that that history continues on. But that's only gonna happen by great conversations with your neighbor not by, well, I saw this video from this influencer and now I hate that person, they must be bad, which is currently what's happening. I mean, really what drove me to be a part of this podcast and Maria knows, I for some reason attract so much hatred when we're on the streets, on the beach, wherever, right? I got attacked on the beach by this lady and it, she just kept calling me Blanco and then yelling at me and attacking me. I had people yelling at me in masks, right, in Spanish. I went down on the Perla, Right, I had a, like a funny altercation there. I've, I've, I've lived, I've survived, 
But, you know, I really came here to get away from the racism and the polarity that was happening. Because when I was in Ohio, there was riots in the streets between the Proud Boys and Black Lives Matter. Every conversation was about racism. I was hoping to come to Puerto Rico and get away from that. And instead, I got put right into the heart of it, where now we're in a situation where we're getting attacked and we're having issues. And so I wanted to speak out about it, you know, and I'm glad that we actually have a chance to be able to do that together. Yeah, I, I think that ultimately it's easy to target the person that's in front of you or the person that's next to you, but those actions aren't going to bring about actual solutions. I think that time well invested would be having conversations with politicians, lobbying in Congress to ensure that the future of Puerto Rico was brighter than it is today. And mm -hmm. I think it's just a waste of time to be arguing with people that just came down because they, they also wanted to find a place to live peacefully. Right. So who's the number one employer in Puerto Rico? Probably the government. It is the government. It is the government, right? And so the point I'm making here is they're the ones that are really in control by employing the most people. And instead of placing the blame on gringos that are coming here, there should be discussion about who wrote the laws. Why was it written this way? What can we do to amend it in the future? Because what has happened has been placed on this island by the government. And that should be, I think, part of the solution is the independent party needs to run for government. We need to have these conversations and bring them on our podcast. And we need to understand why it was written that way so people can be educated. I know, you know, Jesse, you actually talked to him, right? You talked to the person that wrote Act 60? Yeah, I mean, I've, we've, uh, we've talked to him a few times. You know, of course, you've probably met him at uh, some of the Crypto Mondays. I did. I met him at some of the events. What was his take on Act 60 and why it needed to happen and what would happen if it wasn't there? <laughs> I mean, they basically, you know, according to, to this individual, and Raul is his name, if I remember correctly, but basically they were trying to copy the tax incentives of the uh, U.S. Virgin Islands. And so they instituted it in, in 2012 as just kind of a copycat. Other Caribbean islands were doing it. I mean, you know, like the, the British Virgin Islands have a very similar program for residents of the UK. And, um, you know, we have a, a co-worker whose brother you know, took advantage of it in, in um, I believe, St. Croix. So it, it was just kind of a, a literally just a copy and paste. He also said that most of the the actual regulations, Puerto Ricans are eligible for them. He just said that the each individual kind of piece of tax tax incentive is a separate you know form that you have to fill out so it's kind of a bundle package if you're act 60 or you know it's act 20 act 22 now act 60 but he says that basically it was it's one bundle if you do the act 60 if you are a puerto rican resident you're eligible for most of these these programs but you have to fill out each individual piece of paper so you have to be educated he says it's more about education and realizing that Puerto Rican residents are able to take advantage of the exact same thing as outsiders, but it's just nowhere near as convenient since you don't have that bundle. Yeah, things in Puerto Rico are difficult, but Puerto Ricans can get it if they apply and fill out the right forms and go through the right steps, right? Yeah, correct. Especially like if you're a day trader, you know, if you're the no income tax or the the capital gains tax, like that's just one simple form if you're Puerto Rican. So you can take advantage of that. So if you happen to trade crypto or stocks, like there's no different tax incentive if you have Act 60. I mean, even even if you're a gringo and you come to the island, you don't have to get Act 60. You can just get your Puerto Rican driver's license and, and still be exempt from that anyways. It doesn't matter if you have Act 60. Mm -hmm. I, mean, he, I mean, I've talked to a few Puerto Ricans that were like, you know, unless you're making a bunch of money, if you do sign up for Act 60, you have to pay the $10,000 a year donation. They're like, you know, if you're making less money than that, you know, then, you know, some of the, the very affluent people that move to Puerto Rico, you're better off just going to the DMV, switching your driver's license to a Puerto Rican driver's license and then filling out the proper paperwork because you can take advantage of those, those tax incentives. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you, Maria, and you, Marisol, since you guys have been here and you guys are from here, you know, with the real estate development that's happening um, and the gentrification, obviously that is hurting a lot of people. 
Um, but do you see this as something that's detrimental to the island or do you see it as progress? Why, why are the areas in need of improvement and what do you think should be done? Well, coming from San Diego, I can understand that it is hard when you live in a highly gentrified city to be able to find affordable housing. And that's not sustainable. So I do think that there has to be a plan, which the government of Puerto Rico has failed severely in planning since its inception. But there should have been a plan in place. Because once you start having people that are more affluent moving to certain areas, how do you pr protect the prices from areas that are nearby, but the market for those areas are nowhere near in the millions of dollars? For example, a Dorado. Dorado is seen globally as this place for millionaires, but the reality is that there are some areas in Dorado that have regular people middle class people how do you protect their houses from being from the price spikes um how do you ensure that our generation is able to purchase at one point homes because my dream is to retire in puerto rico but sometimes i see the housing prices and i don't know if it's feasible you know i hear this these these conversations you know and like on the mainland like we have the exact same issue i think like a lot of Puerto Ricans that I talk to act as if like this is an issue that's separate to Puerto Rico. I mean, I lived in Colorado ski towns for eight years. Like, you know, most people in Aspen, like the workers in Aspen have to commute an hour and 15 minutes. They live in Glenwood Springs. Yeah, I lived in Telluride. I worked there for four years. I know people that have a three hour commute. They live in Montrose or uh, Norwood or something like that. I mean, they like, I mean, you're talking like, $5 million house minimum in Aspen. Like, I mean, it's insane. And like, it's, that's just in, you know, one example in Colorado, I mean, California, you name any, any state, I think has the exact same issues. I always feel like, you know, Puerto Ricans or when I lived in Central America, they think like every American or, you know, United States citizen on the mainland is some like rich fat cat. And that's just not the case. Like every, every person has these struggles, whether you're in Michigan or Ohio or Wisconsin or California, it's not, endemic to, to Puerto Rico. Right? I think it's just the first time that Puerto Ricans feel so heavily affected by the gentrification and by the increase of real estate prices. And ultimately, wherever it happens, I do disagree that uh, I, I don't agree with the government not protecting people that are in need. Because mm -hmm. I don't think anyone should commute three hours to find employment because then we're, we're a society, society catering to the rich and wealthy. I mean, like, in, for example, like in the 1980s, Des Moines, Iowa, and San Francisco cost about the exact same. Like you could live in Des Moines, Iowa, San Francisco. You could buy a house relatively for similar dollars. And then San Francisco decided to change their housing regulations and it just skyrocketed the price. And a lot of it just simply had to do with regulation more so than supply demand they just mm -hmm. act, you know they they create a different different zoning and and you know you, they inhibited buildings and um i mean government policy obviously has a big effect but i think that you know like in, in puerto rico i mean i think like you can live in 15 20 minutes from dorado for fairly affordable like i mean try living like 15 minutes outside of downtown san francisco i mean you're still screwed I want to make this point real quick, and before I do, I want to make sure that I'm not trying to create more division between Puerto Ricans and gringos. I think that the reality is that Puerto Ricans and gringos get along all over the island, right? The reality is, you know, people are falling in love, people are friends, people have great communication, but the narrative online is that there's a major issue. And I want to share with you guys a little bit about Columbus, Ohio. 15 years ago in Columbus, Ohio, along High Street, the, this area was really run by the gay community, um, and also it was run by artists and musicians. And it was the place to go, right? It looked just like Kaya Luisa. Everybody started going down there. Everybody started going down there. And then people started moving in. And when they started moving in, the landlords figured this out, and they started raising the rent. Now, as they did this, the city got behind it, and they made this area on High Street absolutely gorgeous. 
all the way from downtown, all the way to campus, which is about a four mile stretch. I took Maria there. It literally looks like a 3D printer from the matrix created everything to be perfect, but it was in shambles 15 years ago. Was there a lot of people upset that people, the artists and the people that lived there originally had to move and go to a different area? Yes, but now it's absolutely amazing. And when I go on Kyle Luisa, it looks the same way. And I lived in New Orleans. New Orleans is called the Big Easy. There's a lot of drinking, there's a lot of hanging out and nobody takes care of their property there, okay? Nobody mows their grass, all right? Nobody fixed the roads because they can't. It's absolutely a mess. The roads in New Orleans are way worse than the roads in Puerto Rico. But when you go to New Orleans, when people come to visit, they're like, why is this place falling apart? And they say, well, it's government corruption and people don't take care of their property. And all these outsiders keep moving in here that are tourists and da, 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 da. But when I come down to Puerto Rico, it's the same thing. These things aren't just isolated to Puerto Rico. This happens all over the place. And what I've seen with Puerto Rico is that it is a beautiful island, but people aren't taking care of their property. Not all people. Some people do, right? I can't point it out and say everyone, but for a large majority or a small minority, however you want to look at it, they're not taking care of their property and they're not doing it. And because of that, it's just gotten run down and it's become a culture of letting it go. And I think that, you know, obviously poverty plays a part of that. Obviously oppression plays a part of that, but also there's a culture that's built where every person can help each other out and build their neighborhood. It takes a little bit of paint, it takes some landscaping and it takes some work. And I think part of that is why so many people are attracted to the mainland from Puerto Rico. They leave the island to go to a place where um, there's more HOA and like there's more organization with it. And I, I know I'm gonna be hated for saying that, but I think that we can beautify the island. And I think together as a community, we can grow it and make it better. But I think there's a financial reality that needs to be understood. Puerto Rico has always had a very large amount of people that live below the poverty line. Mm -hmm. And in some places you see a structure that started out with one floor, one you know main floor. And mm -hmm. over time, your son builds a floor above you, your grandson builds a floor above you. And sometimes there's four or five generations living in the same household yeah, the HOA does not exist because the need exists. And the reality about Puerto Rico is that the government has not valued the workers enough to raise their income. And how do you sustain the beautiful home when you just need to put food on the table? So I do understand your point because it's very true. Sometimes you go through communities and, and you wonder what happened here, but you don't prioritize superficial desires when there is need. And in Puerto Rico, most people live in dire need because there isn't the salary to support wants and desires. And I right. think that ultimately there is a lot of focus on things that aren't that important, but if you give every employee a decent salary, if you give people a, dis a decent salary that would attract them into the workforce, because something that we haven't touched upon is the fact that there is a large amount of people in Puerto Rico that live off of social security. And sometimes mm -hmm. people at 35, 40 years old decide to go through the process to start getting social security because they look at the numbers and they say, I might as well just stay at home. I'll have my little side gig that I don't have to report to the, the government and I'm getting social security for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. But really all that creates is a society that is impoverished. Yeah, but Marisol, you made it, right? I mean, you live in a beautiful house in San Diego, right? You, you have crushed it at life. You're giving your kids a better future, you know? So, um, what is the difference for you growing up in your mindset for someone that hasn't done that? What have you done? So over the weekend, I spent time with my family because I was in Puerto Rico for the past couple of weeks and we all got together and my family is very unique. There is a couple of them that want Puerto Rico to be an independent nation. There are a couple that promote that we stay in status quo. 
And then there are a couple that want Puerto Rico to become a state. So when we get together, political conversations are real fun. And I think it is interesting when you hear all the different perspectives. And I still have an uncle that looks at me in the face and says, well, I'm going to die here and no one is going to make me leave from my country. Mm -hmm. But then I have other people that say, yeah, there's nothing good here for the next generation. I made it, but it was a different time. I already have my house. I might as well just stay here. I'm already used to the conditions that are here, but you young people need to go. And then there's other people that are hanging on the dream that one day will be a state and everything will be better. I think that in my case, um, when I graduated law school, I was in a very dark place. I had like $80,000 of student loan and I did not have a job lined up. And some of my friends that did have jobs lined up were going to make thirty-five to $40,000. And I thought that that was not the dream that I had when I decided to go into debt to become an attorney. Um, and in my particular case, I have always been someone that seeks adventure. So the tie that a lot of Puerto Ricans feel with their family, I did not have. And I was willing to make that sacrifice, but I don't judge Puerto Ricans that stay on the island because it is hard. I live in San Diego. I don't have family here. I have two kids. So there isn't the grandma that's calling you and telling you, hey, bring those kids over and have a night off. Christmas is very lonely here. And yeah, you get used to it after a couple of years, but I don't think this is the dream that a lot of people have. And that's why a lot of people move to the States and eventually move back because it is very difficult to be out here. It's very isolating. And ultimately I am very Puerto Rican. I have tried to make friends with Americans, but my personality does not necessarily mesh with Americans. So the friends that I have made are from other countries. I have a Mexican friend. I have a Colombian friend. I have an Israeli friend. And I can mesh more with them because we do feel like foreigners in this country. White people are too uptight and quiet. They can't handle all that spice. I didn't <laughs> want to say that. It's true. Like Marisol. <laughs> like, I feel like I can relate to, to Maricel's, like what she just said in a, you know, coming from a different direction though. Like I mean, I'm from Wisconsin originally. And like, I don't, the reason I left Wisconsin is because, you know, they call Wisconsin like the brain drain state. We're one of the few states where we have, you know, it's a net loss state. It's more people move out every year than to move in or even maintain it. And it's a, a brain drain state because it has a good university system. But most of the people leave because you just can't get a job. I mean, most of my cousins that stayed make, you know, between 20 and $25,000 or you know, about 25000 a year, you know, which is the same or less than what Puerto Ricans make. And so, I mean, I left, I mean, I didn't leave by really by choice. It was just ultimately like what I wanted to do you know, professionally. And when I hear people, you know, say that in Puerto Rico, I'm like, yeah, I, I did the exact same thing, you know, coming from a different direction, coming from, you know, very far North of the, of, uh, the U S to now I'm in the, you know, as far South as you can get. But I mean, it's not a Puerto Rican thing. When I hear a lot of these, you know, like I'll hear Uber drivers talk about this when I'm in the, the Uber. I'm like, yeah, like I, I know exactly what you're talking about. hundred percent. And I'm sure Alex, I mean, you probably can relate to that as well. I mean, why did you leave Ohio? I mean, you were living in New Orleans for a while and. I was looking for a place to, that I could find peace, that I could build a family. I was looking for opportunity, right. And to be in a new industry. Um, I spent 20 years as a dance instructor right? Teaching Latin and African rhythms to white people. So basically I was a miracle worker, but I got tired of doing that, right? I got tired of doing that and I wanted to move forward. So I went from corn to crypto, right? I, I got sucked into the community here and it's, it's been amazing because of the community that's been here. It's been amazing, you know, being in a relationship with Maria and finding her family and how they're so family oriented where so many people in the Midwest have lost that, right? I found something very special here in the Puerto Rican culture. And so the reality for me is, is I've been brought into somebody's family as a gringo, but then what I see online is it's very, very different. 
And, you know, I want to speak, Maria, for, to you for a second. You left and you are coming back. I think, you know, you have some um, friends, you know, from Georgia that are coming back. Um, and I, I personally think, you know, instead of Gringo Go Home, it's Bariqua Come Home, right? We need to make sure that people come back to the island. And, um, you know, for you, when you came, you had $500 and now you bought your condo, right? You're able to do that and you did that in a year's time, right? Can you tell us a little bit about how you did that? Well, yeah, I was living in the mainland for two years. I had some problems and <laughs> then I moved back because here's my family here. Um, I had an opportunity to grow a little bit and I need it home, I miss home. So I came back and I just went out, met the gringos and got a job. And the gringos pay really good. I cannot say otherwise. And thanks to that, um, I could buy my, uh, my own apartment, I could buy my car, I can make all my payments and I can save money and I can invest money. So I'm having a great time. But mm -hmm. in the sense that Boricua come home or Puerto Rico come home instead of Gringo go home, Puerto Rico needs to create a plan to bring those people back because there's no mm -hmm. opportunities here. Like Marisol had to decide to sacrifice her life and make a commitment and move around the world because she is not only in San Diego, she's been all around and been deployed and all that. And I know a lot of people that it's been doing the same thing. Um, and it's because here we don't have opportunities. I left because I didn't have an opportunity. The opportunity came Two years later, when I was living in the mainland, they wanted me back. And I miss home, I miss my family, I have an opportunity, let's go back. But I also had an opportunity to stay in San Diego. And I also had an opportunity to stay in Georgia. So I decided to come back just for culture, and family, home, commitment to my friends, I miss them. And Boricua come home, I will love it. I would love to have all my family here. My brother is living in Georgia. Marisol is living in San Diego. She's one of my best friends with her kids. They are my kids, basically. And I would love them to come back and we all be in this little island having fun and then beaches and all that. But it's not possible. Money-wise, not possible. There's no um, opportunities for that many people. The government, Puerto Ricans, and the new um, gringos that are coming back, that are coming here and they're moving here and building industry and building and creating jobs, um, it needs to be way, way more than that. Way more. Because now there is opportunity for a few, but not for everyone. Well, I want to share with the people out there that our narrative and what we've experienced is very different, right? What we are experienced personally is different than what we're seeing online. And I actually want to share there is opportunity, but it's hard to find. Um, recently, there was a hackathon, right? And what a hackathon is, is where a developer that creates code, and it was in the crypto community, goes and presents their project. They have like three days to create a project, and then venture capitalists or investors come in and they award people in a contest with money for their project. And if they do a really good job, that person gets hired, right? So in this hackathon, we had all young Puerto Rican talent, really great minds that had created projects that were innovative. There was a guy in this hackathon that figured out a way to change the way we vote. He would vote and he created a, a plan where you can vote using your phone through a thumbprint, face print, uh, our face recognition, voice recognition, right? And be able to tell where you're at and then do the voting in the blockchain so nobody can alter it. That could change the world, right? And so this is the kind of stuff that was there. And while we were there, it was a little bit uncomfortable. It was a little bit awkward. But you know what? 
after it was all said and done, there was people that got paid for the projects. There was people that were hired. I think Puerto Rico could be the next developer community in the world with the OGs and crypto that are here and with the schools like the Holburton School. Shout out to Holburton, by the way. You should go there and check it out if you're looking for a career. Um, to put that together and to be able to train Puerto Ricans in this skill so they can create the future of crypto, that would be amazing. But that's not gonna happen with the narrative of don't talk to people in crypto, stay on your own side, da 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 we should hate them. It only is gonna happen if we come together and have some unity. I mean, I have a completely different opinion about crypto than, than Alex does. So that can, that'll be a, a different episode for sure. But I want to get back to what, like, you know, what Marisol said. They're saying people, okay? They're not. The autistic uh, geniuses <laughs> of the world run crypto and they're, they're little, they're different. They're different, but they're but, different good. But I want to get back to what, you know, Marisol, you said you were back recently in, in uh, Puerto Rico and you were, you know, having this conversation with your family about, you know, if you support, you know, statehood or, you know, independence, I mean, what are just kind of run us through some of the, like, you know, the talking points that actual like Puerto Ricans have that, you know, like gringos like myself and Alex wouldn't necessarily, you know, really have that insight on. So what's interesting is my uncle who is very passionate about Puerto Rican independence. I asked him about the gringo go home movement and he told me, that his philosophy is that the world should be without borders. That if he wanted to move to Costa Rica or Venezuela, he should be able to make that move. And if he wanted to contribute to that society, he should be able to. So in his opinion, Puerto Rico should be open to anyone that wants to come to Puerto Rico and actually contribute in a positive manner. And he is a small business owner so he also understands the perspective that if there's an empty building and someone has the money to buy it, of course you should buy it and you should be able to utilize it in the best way that is advantageous to your business. So he doesn't have a negative perception of the you know, US mainlanders that are coming into Puerto Rico. What he does believe wholeheartedly, and I think that this is truly the issue that is being missed with the Green Go Go Home movement is he thinks that the Puerto Rican government has a plan to deteriorate Puerto Rico and its infrastructure and its society to the point that there is a mass exodus, which has been occurring since Maria. And that is going to give people from the exterior the opportunity to move in. And like Alex said, the Borico Go Home movement uh, come home movement, that would be great. But as the government continues to deteriorate Puerto Rico, I'm going to be honest with you, it broke my heart being in Puerto Rico this last time. And it was really hard for me because my dream has always been to go back and retire. I took my kids to the University of Puerto Rico. I took pictures of them there. I bought them little memorabilia because I want them to study where I studied. But some things happened that made me really question whether or not Puerto Rico is a feasible place for a retirement home, not only because of the luxuries that you experience in other places, but just basic safety, because I had a rental vehicle that was stolen and that was very shocking to me. And I think that those type of things are the things that people don't understand that gentrification does help. Gentrification helps people be safe where they live. And safety is crucial, especially to a mother of two. So ultimately, back to your original question, my uncle does believe wholeheartedly that the government is trying to make Puerto Rico a place where Puerto Ricans don't want to live because eventually they'll be able to sell it for cheap to anyone that comes back. And I think that it is being achieved in a way because every year, every pass of a hurricane, every time the wind blows and people lose power, people get sick of that. And sure, things in the US aren't perfect, definitely not, but there are some basic necessities that you have that you can just live very easily, not having to question whether or not the next day you're gonna be able to keep the groceries in your freezer cold. 
Um, for the people that want statehood from my family, they do see the fact that the U.S. runs well and Puerto Ricans don't know how to run the island. That's the general perception. And they feel that if Puerto Rican if Puerto Rico was a state, there would be more oversight, there would be a lot more structure, and there would be more funding to be able to elevate Puerto Rico to a level such as other states. I don't necessarily agree with them because we've seen a Detroit, a New Orleans. There are a lot of areas in the U.S. that are neglected by the government. So ultimately, I do think that poverty is a burden for the government and some governments just choose to neglect people that live in poverty. So I don't think statehood is necessarily a solution. It does bring about some positive changes, but if we as Puerto Ricans do not take our vote seriously, if we continue electing to office the same people that have put us in this precarious position, there will be no change. And I think that Puerto Ricans throughout their history do not understand the value of their vote. And that's why for generations, they vote for the same people, despite the fact that there are reports of corruption, there are reports of them um, taking nepotism to the extreme, having the general manager of the cafeteria in the Senate making $8,000 a month, you know, we know these things, the reports come out, but yeah. over and over again, they keep voting for the same people. And politicians pass down their seat. So if you were the, uh, the mayor of a municipality and you did great things for decades and decades, when you retire, you say, vote for my son, and there they go. And they vote for your son, despite the fact that your son might be completely incompetent. So what, what do you favor personally, Marisol? I'm very clear that the status quo is not the status that I want for Puerto Rico. That is what I'm very clear about. I am at this point where I think that we either need to be independent or we need to be a state. That's it. Because the status quo has not brought us to a place where we live a dignified way. And I know that People might hear that, this and be upset with the fact that I say we, but I am Puerto Rican. And despite the fact that I don't live on the island, that's how I feel, that we are we. Um, when I was in the university, I was pro-independence because I want that for my country. I, I want us to be able to elevate ourselves to the status of a Singapore, for example, where we're sustainable, where we're making money and where people come to invest because they see the value in us and because we see the value in ourselves. But as I've aged, I wonder if Puerto Ricans truly do see the value in our island. I wonder if Puerto Ricans see the value of work ethic. I think one of the things that I dislike the most about Bianca's video is that there is this perception of victimhood that Puerto Ricans have that I don't subscribe to. I entirely feel that whatever your life hands you, that's not what you have to make the reality for the rest of your life. And I think a lot of people in Puerto Rico feel, for example, my father was born in, the pro in a housing project in Puerto Rico. And my mom and him met and they got married and they started living there. Once my mom got divorced, she decided that she wanted something better for herself and for her kids. She decided that she didn't want to raise her kids in the projects. So once she got divorced, she left the projects. My father's still there. And that's okay, because that's what he chose. But I think it's important to understand that these are choices. You can choose to go out and educate yourself. You can choose to work hard and go to a different place. There are, gener in my family's case, there's like four generations of Quinones that live in housing projects. Hi, baby. What's up? No, show your beautiful boy. He's, he's amazing. <laughs> he's a beautiful boy. Look at that. <laughs> beautiful kid needs to go to sleep. 
Excuse me. <laughs> I want, just for Elijah, I want to talk for a second about victimhood and why I believe Bianca is the black widow of Puerto Rico poisoning the people. Because she's using a manipulation tactic that we saw with the last presidential campaign. Trump broke the algorithm by being outrageous, by blaming Mexicans, right? By blaming whoever he could for the problems. He used xenophobia, racism, and he was so outrageous with the things that he said, he started going viral and the news media couldn't stop, right? They kept putting him up, putting him up, putting him up. Next thing you know, this guy is now the number one Republican candidate, and he's got a whole full of people, room of people that are wearing his hats, coming to his rallies. And where did that end up? It ended up in civil unrest, right? Now, if you look at what Bianca's doing, you have somebody that's beautiful, well-spoken, intelligent, but she knows exactly what she's doing. She's using that same message to rally people to put her up and to be able to make her come forward. But she's not doing the second part of it. Trump had make America great again, right? Trump had USA, USA, right? Same thing that the Nazis had. They were really wanting to make Germany an economic and military power. But she doesn't offer a solution for anybody or any empowering. She's only putting a narrative of victimhood or victimization. And that's not empowering Puerto Ricans. I do believe Puerto Rico can come together and become independent. And one way that it would happen is you've got to find an industry that really works for Puerto Rico, right? Besides the service industry and tourism and the government being the number one employer. You've got to find an industry that works here, whether that's exporting or manufacturing or, you know, technology or finance. Some industry Puerto Rico has got to rally around. Then you've got to have your own currency. Then you've got to have a military, right? Those steps are very, very difficult. Right. But the first thing is, you know, making Puerto Rico believe that they can do it and they can step forward with it. And I think Bianca is poisoning the people as the Black Widow, telling them that they're all victims and not offering a solution. I mean, I think the, the whole victim mentality is just easy for people to grab onto because you never have to, like, strive for anything. If you fail, it's just because it's someone else's fault. Like, it, it really just limits people. Like, mm -hmm. oh, like, I wanted to do this, but the reason I didn't accomplish it was because I was oppressed by I mean, name the government or name the, the class or institution or whatever. That's the alleged oppressor. I think it's just a, a very simple narrative that people, like you said, with Trump, I mean, they, they clung to that. And, and I mean, they've been using that since really the 1960s, really. I mean, probably before I guess you said, we, we go back to, to Europe in the you know 1930s, but I think it's definitely a very pervasive, you know, attitude in Puerto Rico as well. But I mean, I see it really everywhere. I mean, people love to be victims because it absolves them from any responsibility. Yeah, life on the island is not easy, right? We had to throw out all our food and we had power outages and water out. As soon as we went to the grocery store to get our food, uh, we put it in the, the fridge, but there was like power surges and literally our refrigerator blew up. There was like a sound like a giant firecracker went off in the kitchen smoke everywhere and we were like you know we freaked out figured it out and then we plugged it in somewhere else and the smoke started happening again and you know there's a chance for toxic gases and we had to try to save the food and so we you know went to maria's family and we were able to do it life in puerto rico is not easy but that's the price you pay to be able to have something that's so beautiful like paradise right in ohio i loved ohio they have so many comforts but it's boring Okay, Midwest life is extremely boring. Everybody's in their little box. Everybody has the same thoughts, the same mentality, the same everything. They all go to high street and party every weekend. And then they go to their jobs nine to five. And that's just how Midwestern life is. In Puerto Rico, there's more of a sense of being present in the moment and spending time with one another. And I really love that. You know, yes, there's issues, but there's also pros to it. And you know, I plan to be here a long time. That's one reason I'm passionate about you know, trying to put a different narrative out there so people don't feel like they can't do anything about it. There is something we can do about it. And I think it's come together. Well, Maria. I always thought that education is the key for someone to be able to progress. That's why I was always so passionate about my own education. And mm -hmm. I would definitely want to see Puerto Ricans be able to get trained and educated in a field that pays well and that is sustainable in an island. Um, in the, I believe in the 90s and early 2000s, one of the most 
profitable um, sectors in Puerto Rico was the pharmaceutical sector. And it, it was due to very lucrative tax incentives that these pharmaceuticals came down to Puerto Rico and established themselves. And especially on the northern coast of Puerto Rico, you would see that some families, like three generations, were being employed by the same pharmaceutical, but they were being well paid. And when those tax incentives went away, the pharmaceuticals disappeared. And you can still go to some places and see that they have the abandoned structures and the whole family collapsed financially because they depended on that. Mm -hmm. So well, whatever- Also like tested people and they made them infertile, right? I mean, they were abusing- the No, so, so that that's separate, that was previous to this okay. specifically. These pharmaceuticals were just making pills that you would take off the counter, stuff like that. Gotcha. Like a think, Pfizer, like a Pfizer, for example. Yeah, I think what, what Alex was referring to is more, more like pre nineteen seventies. I mean, Bill Clinton was the president that eliminated that that tax and that that tax incentive in nineteen ninety six over the course of a, a twelve year period. So by what two thousand mid two thousand ten ish around that, I mean, like it was completely eliminated. Uh, Correct. But that's why I'm saying that in the same way that these pharmaceuticals came and established themselves and we did see a benefit to the employment status of a lot of Puerto Ricans, there has to be a sector that we can incentivize to come down to Puerto Rico and establish themselves. I think that there is a lot of resentment to the crypto sector, primarily because you could do crypto by yourself, you don't really need employees. So that resentment comes from the fact that you're not sharing your wealth. And I have no resentment in, towards that, but I do see a reality that Puerto Ricans want people to come down and share their wealth. So what sector can come down that needs employees, that needs to hire people, that needs to hire people and train them and give them actual skills that they can get paid for in a way that can give them a dignified life. Yeah, but if you're, I mean, if you're from North, you know, North Dakota or any other state that has tax incentives, I mean, I guess I'm always wondering why, like I always hear from Puerto Ricans that you need to come down and, you know, contribute. I'm not even really sure what that even means, but like, if it's your wealth, I mean, why are you supposed to share it with someone else? I mean, I well, feel like, Let's talk if about contribution. Have... Like, where does my money go to? I'm not paying like somebody back in Ohio. Every single time I leave the house, it goes to someone in Puerto Rico, right? Like, um, so the fact that you know people that move here don't contribute is a lie because every time you leave the house and you do anything and you hand over money, you are contributing financially. And Maria, like, how many people does Brock employ that are Puerto Rican? At least thirty. Right. And so the narrative is he doesn't do anything for Puerto Rico. He doesn't make it happen. But I've seen him make an initiative. Now, look, he's not a perfect person. None of us are. Right. But he has really tried to help Puerto Rico and Puerto Ricans. And I've seen him personally be able to do that by hiring people, be able to make that work. But everybody in the crypto community is too afraid to talk. Right? They've got too much to lose. They're scared to be able to put it out there. And so nobody's saying anything and we have a one-sided voice. But the fact of the matter is Brock employs 30 Puerto Ricans. So in crypto, if you make it big enough, you do need an organization to be able to employ people. I do think that there is a difference in mentality. Um, the Puerto Rican mentality is about community. Mm -hmm. And that's why people come down to Puerto Rico and live there a lot of times because they feel that sense of community. So I do understand the point. Why do I have to share my wealth? I created it. Great. I do understand that. But that is not the Puerto Rican mentality. The Puerto Rican mentality is if you rise up, you take everyone with you. Mm -hmm. So that is why there is such hate and resentment to the crypto community because it's not something that inherently requires you to share your wealth with everyone else. I want to disagree with that. And here's why I came here, not a part of the crypto community. I didn't want to be a part of that. I want to be different than them, but I made friends here with that community so quickly and they brought me in 
it was really pretty incredible. I had somebody, a friend from Ohio that introduced me to everybody and she said, Hey, this is my brother, Alex, and I want you guys to be able to take care of him." And literally that has what has happened for me with that community. Now, is it an exclusive group? Yeah. You know, I would say that they don't want to have issues. They don't want to have protests. They don't want to be in a documentary. They don't want to have, you know, stuff like that. So they've created a little bubble, but the community has really looked out for one another. If you're new to the island, there's like 40 WhatsApp groups for everything you could ever imagine. You're immediately invited, included, you're brought in because we're a little immigrant bubble that's here, right? And then when Maria came to, you know, two events, she got hired and she was there for two months and then got hired by somebody else and got a huge raise. So the crypto community has been pretty inclusive, right? For people that are open to it, but it's a matter of being open and willing to take that step. Yeah, but you're, you're missing my point. I'm not talking about community as in friendship. I'm talking about the impact you're making to the community. For example, mm. during the during the documentary, um, Bianca mentioned that there is a school that has been purchased and it's going to be restored and redefined as an apartment building. And she criticizes that because that school was an elementary school. Mm -hmm. What she didn't mention is what you educated me on. The investor that bought the school is going to build a school close by. Mm. That is community impact. And that is the type of marketing that has to be done to educate Puerto Ricans on, yes, there are investors that are taking opportunities that exist on the island, but they're giving back to the community at large. They're not going to be your best friend, but guess what? They have built you a high-tech, modern school that services the community. Yeah. Well, as far as community goes, when Brock got here, he tried to build a school and he got a lot of protest about it. He got pushed back. You know, I get attacked online. What are you doing for the community? Well, when Hurricane Fiona hit, our friends, our group of friends created a donation center. We organized donations and we got them to Ponce and Utuado. Some of these people that are very wealthy that don't really have to work, they have dedicated full time to volunteer efforts to be able to go and do that. And there are people that really care about the community. But online, what you get is don't participate in Integro, right? Don't participate with any of these people that are owned by gringos. And I think it should be the other way around. If these people are willing to donate and they're willing to donate their time and actually their money, absolutely you should be able to make that work. You know, I went to one event where the Boys and Girls Club um, came to a Crypto Monday and they were able to raise $70,000 in like 10 minutes. You know, I mean, so it's like if you have an open mentality and you're willing to cross that bridge, there's people that are willing to meet you with a little bit of support. Well, and I don't doubt that people in the crypto community could bring a lot of funding that we don't inherently have access to, to be able to restore every single public school in Puerto Rico, which needs restoration. But Maybe it is because of the personality of the people that go down there. I don't know. I think that there isn't enough said about the good that is happening and about the charitable work that is happening. And it may be that y'all want to be silent donors, silent givers. And that's beautiful. I'm not saying it isn't right. But definitely when you have this loud voice saying, gringo, go home, yeah. Uh, sometimes I wonder, maybe there should be a little camera that records the efforts that a lot of people are doing every time that Puerto Ricans are in need. Yeah, I was just gonna <laughs> gonna say that. I mean, I lived in you know over a dozen a dozen countries, and you know have been to over fifty. I mean, and I feel like it. The people are the same everywhere you go. Everyone has the exact same problems. I mean, this is just human problems. I mean. It's economic problems. And I mean, everyone, I mean, to act as if like the Puerto Ricans somehow have some, you know, like they're the only people that care about community and gringos don't, I feel like it's kind of a, it's disingenuous to, to, you know, to gringos. Like they somehow go to Puerto Rico and they just don't, don't care about community, but Puerto Ricans do. I mean, it's just a matter of what, you know, what resources do you have at your disposal and are you able to, be able to make, you know, certain arrangements, but 
I don't think that Puerto Ricans are inherently superior in terms of their community giving givenness compared to, to the gringos that are on the, on the island. I think when you're in situations with emergencies, you get really good at helping out your neighbor. It was like that in New Orleans, right? They were amazing when there was a problem in New Orleans about coming together as a neighborhood, as a district, right? As a city. And they did a good job of keeping the spirits up. But in Ohio, like where I lived before, there was never any disasters and nobody really wanted to talk to each other at all. So, and you know, it's not that people don't care. You're right. It is disingenuous. But I think when you have and more of an emergency situation, you have a need to come together. The way that New York did for 9-11, right? New York really came together to be able to make a difference in that moment. So maybe that's the difference. I don't know, I'm just speculating here. I think that Puerto Ricans, and not just Puerto Ricans, I've met people from the Philippines and from Hawaii, from different islands that tend to have the same type of value. You know, when you live in, in an island Family usually comes first, your faith and your community comes first, and those are the tenets that you live by. And I do think that for Puerto Ricans specifically, maybe it is the inherent struggle that they're constantly living in that causes them to always be looking out for their neighbor. Mm -hmm. So for Puerto Ricans, it's challenging when someone owns a $17 million house and it's not sharing, you know, 50% of their wealth because how they see it is, why are you being so greedy? Why do you need a $17 million house? You could get a $1 million house and that's enough. And I understand the perspective of, well, I, I worked for it. I can afford it. But I think that that's why it's challenging for some people because they do see it as greed. Right. Well, where does Ricky Martin and, and Bad Bunny live? I, that's a great question. Where do they live? Well, Ricky Martin oh, has yeah. a house in Dorado. I say, I, I scream <laughs> to him every time I go there. He never, he's never there, but I, I dream of seeing him in the balcony. Um, <laughs> but he has a house in Dorado. Bad Bunny may be in Dorado, I don't know. He, ne he has never disclosed his location in the island, but he doesn't live in Santurce. Definitely. Surely. Um, you know. But Ladies, I want to ask you, do you think that Gringo Go Home is going to succeed as a movement besides likes and views? Um, do you think that there is an end game with them? Or what, what do you think? Is, is, is it going to be a winning formula? I don't think so. No, I don't think so. Yeah, when, when you are sharing or promoting hate towards people i think it never never succeeds because we're supposed to be respectful to one each other we're supposed to be loving and kind people especially puerto ricans because i see ourselves like that i see ourselves as, as welcoming and loving and hey come here let's party we're the party people um and when you try to just give this speech about hate, let's, because I have been watching social media and I've been reading this uh, comments and po uh, on their um, posts for Gringo Go Home, and they are saying, hashtag let's make them beer or let's take like, make them go home and all that. Make them afraid. It was like terrorizing make, people, right? Yeah. yeah. Make them afraid. Make them afraid. It's like, what are you really promoting? It's like violence. Like, are we people that now, because someone comes here with money and wants to invest in Puerto Rico or comes here to live in paradise, because that's how we see Puerto Rico, um, we want them to make them fear, make them leave. They don't, when we go to the mainland and you, most of Puerto Rican go to Disney, you don't go to Disney and they say, let's get Puerto Ricans out. We don't want them here. Let's get Mexicans out. We don't want them here. Let's get Asians out. We don't want them here. Obviously not. They're bringing economy. They're bringing something 
valuable to the community or to the place or whatever. You don't receive them with hate. So I don't think it's gonna last a lot, like a long time, but it's a little bit concerning and how the, the message is being received by a lot of Puerto Ricans. Let's look at the, um, I don't want to call them African Americans. They're Americans, right? They're Americans. But let's look at that community um, that succeeded. Martin Luther King won that battle, right? There was a lot of civil rights change and he pre preached, I have a dream. But then when gangster rap came out, which by the way, I love the music, um, they promote fuck the police. And then what you had there when you started pitting people against each other is a massive increase in police brutality and killings because it was one side that hated one side, one side that hated the other. And then it changed into Black Lives Matter, which is really, we are worthy, right? We are people of worth. And they won that battle against the Proud Boys. So if you look at it throughout history, if you have a speech that is compassionate communication, it brings the people together in a way that wins. And if you have negative communication, it loses. I mean, the same thing with Obama with Yes We Can or the LGBTQ community with Love is Love. Like these type of messages and mantras, they win in history if you look back and anything that's xenophobic or racism, like they have a rise, but they also have a massive fall and it ends up really bad. And that's why I feel Bianca is not the figurehead for this movement. There needs to be a leader that comes together and understands how to bring people together and has a different communication. I mean, in 2022, we're talking about, you know, influencers on, on YouTube that have a platform because they have YouTube, but they have zero skills or qualifications outside of mm -hmm. the fact that they have a phone, a microphone, maybe some... She did go to Syracuse University. She was a reporter. She was actually a professional reporter. She has some <laughs> skills. Yeah, so you could say the same thing about Jake Paul and Logan Paul. And I mean, you know, the, the interview we saw recently with Elon Musk, I mean, who are, who are the people doing that? I mean, these people have millions of views that 50 years ago, of course, never would have had the, the microphone or the platform to do it. I mean, I think we're, we're in a completely different age. I mean, I think if not anything else, like go Bianca, she obviously has some marketing skills and I think she, she understands has, what she's doing. She is good. Hats off yeah, to you. She, She's good at what, what she does. I mean, is it good for society? I think that's a completely separate issue than what is Bianca good at? Yeah. <laughs> I just wish there was a more positive message in society. That's all. You know, she's not making Puerto Rico better, in my opinion. Not with you. I think I'm always with you. I think, you know, positive message. I mean, like, you know, Marisol was talking about, you know, Puerto Ricans being good at community. Well, if they're so good at, at, at community, why are they have an anti-gringo go-home movement? It doesn't seem that's that, that community-orientated to me, but... Well, that's a yeah, small but I, minority. I think that, yeah, I, I think that, you know, if you look at the University of Puerto Rico, historically, the riots and, you know, all the social unrest starts there. And throughout the years, the people that riot, the people that cause social unrest are a minority. The challenge is that the majority of students don't have time and don't have interest to go and fight these people. So most people throughout the years, let them have their day. They let them say what they had to say. And they talked for all the students at the University of Puerto Rico, but it was only like 20 persons per gate that were out there having the riot. And eventually everyone knew that we were gonna go back to school. And I think very similarly, the Gringo Go Home movement does not represent the majority of Puerto Ricans. Like I mentioned before, my uncle, he is pro independence of Puerto Rico, but he said, if Americans want to come here and buy up things and want to bring business, I'm for it. They should have the right to come wherever they want to come and spend the money that they decided to invest however they want to invest it. If I can't buy it, why am I going to get mad at someone else for buying it? So 
I don't think the gringo go home movement is one as popular as it may seem. It just might be loud. And two, it does not absolutely represent the majority of Puerto Ricans, because I'm sure that outside of the metro area, most people don't even care. Because if you're in Lajas, if you're in Utuado, if you're in Comerillo, if you're in Calle, you don't care because the majority of mainland Americans aren't in those cities. So you haven't impacted them in any type of way. Mm -hmm. They're living their life normally. So I think the important thing is what do real Puerto Ricans feel? Go out through a uh, Trujillo Alto, go to an Atillo and ask them if they're mad about the fact that U.S. mainlanders have moved to Puerto Rico and they're going to be like, whatever, if they want to move here, that's fine by me. You know, her video was very focused. It was very specific. She went to Puerto Nuevo, which is a specific community. She talked to very specific people that are being affected by the fact that these buildings are being bought up. But she didn't talk to the whole island. So I think that to say that these feelings of gringo go home take away from the actual nature of Puerto Ricans, it's just not true. Puerto Ricans are who they are. We are very welcoming. We are very loving. You could be anywhere having any type of struggle and there will be a Puerto Rican that will help you. If you don't know anyone in a week, someone's gonna invite you over for dinner and teach you how to dance salsa. You know, they're using hate speech and they're using specific people and specific communities to target the mainlanders that live on the island, but that's not representative of everyone. It's a great point, Marisol, thank you. Yeah, I think like that was a, a great point. That's the whole reason why we, I mean, we started this podcast. I mean, I read a stat once, I think it was, two or 3% of Twitter users are responsible for something like 91% of all tweets, you know, where it's just a small minority of people kind of dominate the majority of tweets. And I think there's a lot of, you know, the people that want to, you know, have these topics want to have the clickbait or the, the topics or the discussions that are going to get the views. And so, you know, Alex and I started this, you know, along with Maria to actually, try to provide some balance to this conversation. Cause I, th I think you are a hundred percent, you know, Marisol with, with that analysis, I think it was spot on. Mm -hmm. And you know what? <laughs> the other day, Alex asked me about bad money. And if I thought he was a sellout because now he's pop and not so much hardcore reggaeton. He went from hard and, and soft really fast. Yeah. <laughs> and my response to most things, <laughs> my response to most things is, Everyone needs to put food on the table. Everyone's looking to get paid. So Bianca's getting paid. She found the community that she is now the advocate for. She found her little slogan and she found a sponsor in Bad Bunny that is promoting what she's doing. Girls getting paid. I'm not gonna hate on her for doing that. Do I agree with it? No, because I don't think that you should create this hateful environment that can lead to crime, which is a whole different conversation. So I don't agree with her methods, but ultimately she has found a way to become successful in her eyes and in the eyes of the people that follow her. Yeah, I don't so. hate that either. I just hate the way that she's done it because she was it was very calculated to do it with that type of communications background, watching it happen, and then the way that it's been orchestrated. And I really just call out to her to come up with a solution. If there's something better than Act 60, if there's another solution out there, I would love to hear it. You made a documentary about the problem. Let's see a documentary about the solution. Well, not only a solution, but say the truth, mm. right? Because as I mentioned, she talks about the school that has been bought for the purpose of making apartment rentals, but she doesn't talk about the fact that the same investor is going to create a school that he's going to donate. So you have to say the whole truth because if not, you're not, you don't have any type of integrity. And that's where we see your real intention, which is to just create havoc. Well, she's a storyteller. She says she's an independent reporter, but she's a storyteller. She's creating a narrative. Well, for her, yeah, well, she wouldn't consider herself creating havoc. I'm sure if you asked her, she probably thinks she's creating 
content. I'm a content creator. She's creating views or whatever metric we're using right now with, uh, you know, web three or whatever, you know, internet we're on, I don't know, web 2.5, whatever. What web are we on right now? I, f- I forget. I don't know. We're at 2.9, 3, 5, 9, 3, 5, 3, 1 decimal points. It's going up and down. It's very volatile. Yeah. Yeah, but I have a problem with the story that she's telling because the story that she's telling and the story that most of these people are telling is Puerto Rico is a nation of people that live in poverty, and that's how we want to remain. Mm. Puerto Rico is a nation that used to live off the agriculture. That stopped it happening years ago, but that's where we want to go back to. And there is some nostalgia to it, but you know what? My grandma had 10 brothers and sisters and they lived in a three bedroom house and walked around barefoot. She does not want to go back to that. And I think that there is a reality. We cannot go back. We need to move forward. Progress means change and change is uncomfortable for a lot of people, but change usually is positive. Change challenges you to bring out the best in you and change educates you because you might not be doing everything the best way possible. And to say that we have to have a San Juan of the 1930s is not realizing and not understanding that the developments of the 2020s might be positive for San Juan. Who knows? Maybe we could dream of a day where we have underground power grids and a wind doesn't blow out my electricity in my home. But without change and without progress, we can't dream of a different tomorrow. And that's what really gets me upset about her narrative because she shows people that have protected the status of being impoverished. Mm -hmm. You've lived four generations in the same community, in the same circumstances. Don't you want more for yourself? And I'm not saying that you have to lose your sense of community for that, but you can better yourself. So I wanna make a speculation real quick about Luma and why it's not getting better. Um, From what I read and what I studied, you know, by 2050, Puerto Rico has to move 100% to renewable energy. So why would you invest in the old way of doing things, right, if you know that it's a dying industry? Now, again, this is just a speculation. I don't know what's really going on in the work that's being done. There's probably a more positive story that's out there. But the energy crisis in Puerto Rico is a major problem. And the government is trying to do something, but it's literally 28 years down the road that it's going to you know, have to change. And the thing is something needs to change right now, right? Something needs to get better for us right now because you know, living without power, um, just because the wind blows, because really, you know, you saw in the news, the South and the West of the island just got wrecked. Like it was horrible, but we were on the North side of the island here in San Juan. It honestly was just a little bit of rain and a little bit of wind. It wasn't that bad, but it affected the entire island. So there's a major infrastructural problem that needs to be addressed. Um, I just don't know if there's enough money in it for people to be incentivized to make that change because they know it's going to go to renewable energy down the road. Yeah, I think it's one of those things where the government never has money to improve the citizens' daily life, but there is money. There can be changes. And you know what? 28 years down the road, some of us might not even be here to benefit from that. Why would you, why should we have to suffer for three decades because they want to save a buck? Yeah. Right. I mean, I think that's a good point you make, you know, Marisol about the three you know decades down the road. I mean, you know, we right now, you know, like the whole getting to net zero, which just isn't realistic in a very short time, but you're right. Like you're pushing this stuff down the road, but the people in the meantime, like are, I mean, a lot of, there's a lot of countries in the world where people die because they don't have clean drinking water, they don't have access to electricity to run basic, you know, appliances. And what about the people that are living right now, let alone, you know, worrying about people in, in three decades right now? If you can't get to the next 30 years, well, then who cares about the future if, it, if there is no future? And to make these, you know, these very oppressive regulations through, you know, the WEF or some of these other... NGOs, these global NGOs that don't live in Puerto Rico, 
it creates kind of this global poverty. I don't remember the phrase that you said, Jesse, but um, basically Puerto Rico has become a very old society because most of the people that go to the University of Puerto Rico, we, we don't pay much to go there, thankfully, but then we see the opportunities in the mainland and we have a main a mass exodus of the professionals. So there are a lot of old people that live on the island that don't have family to take care of them. There was a condominium in Isla Verde. They didn't have power for four days and the elevators were not working during that time. 16 floors. I personally am not fit enough to go up 16 floors. And the community got together to identify the people that were er elderly that needed to have some groceries. They did a potluck style dinner so everyone could eat at least one warm meal a day. But what do you say to these older people that have machines that are quite literally keeping them alive? And that's why I say it's absolutely ludicrous that we just allow this to continue being the status quo that the power goes out every other day just because. What do you say to the people that need power to stay alive? I breastfed my children and if I lost power for 24 hours, I would very literally cry because that is a lot of golden milk that would have been lost. And there are women in Puerto Rico that were probably in the same situation over the past couple of days because of Fiona. And that shouldn't be the case. If you went though to the top five people in the Act 60 community and you said, hey, we have a plan to solve the power grid and we can put your name on it as donors and founders, these people, I believe, would give wholeheartedly to be able to do it but not if they're being attacked online, if there's protests in person, if there's issues with it as they go, because you've got to have, you can't have that much friction when you're trying to raise capital to be able to solve problems. You know, there is philanthropy, and I don't want to say these guys are perfect, okay? There is philanthropy because you really care and you serve and you can do it privately. And then there's philanthropy through ego, right? And, you know, I don't know which one it would be, but most likely like people would want to put their name and their legacy on that solution, but there is capital here to be able to make it come true. I think it's really just a matter of presenting a proposal that makes sense. Um, I don't know enough about the industry with Luma and what the problems are, but it definitely has affected us personally. You know what, I think that change is always gonna be controversial and no positive change in the energy infrastructure is going to come easily, you know, before Luma, it was Utier, and people would criticize Utier, and they would say that they were just using money to give their employees bonuses, that they never did the work, that you would see them in the lights, not working on their actual job, just like malandering. And you know what? Now we have Luma, and now we hate Luma, and now we want to go back to Utier, which was very hated five years ago. I wholeheartedly believe Puerto Ricans have this negative aspect of them. They are going to criticize the hell out of absolutely anything that comes because they don't like change. So on this topic, I think that someone should just come in determined with a plan, full speed ahead, make the plan, be it, have a successful plan, because mm -hmm. obviously there's a lot of PTSD from the lack of success. And once people see, oh, things work. Oh, I don't need to buy a thousand dollar generator to light my house up because the power is not going off every other day. They're ten thousand dollars, by the way. What? The generators here are like ten grand. Yeah. I'm talking about the cheap ones that just run your your. <laughs> <laughs> but I I think that there has to be a plan. There has has to be valiant investors that are willing to take the backlash. And once people see the benefit of the change, oh, it was the best thing ever. Exactly. So I have a question for you too. Do you feel that you are at risk living in Puerto Rico? In terms of like what specifically? 
because of the gringo go home movement, when you walk around, when you go to restaurants, do you feel that your safety is at risk? Uh, I, I feel at risk for this podcast. I think I'm going to get a lot of like hate stuff, you know, in my inbox, but I don't feel at risk when I'm out in public. Right. I don't, I don't feel an issue when, when I'm outside, I feel it's fine. I think online you have a lot of keyboard warriors, right? But when you meet somebody, if you're not able to recognize who they are as a person, um, it's not somebody I want to hang out with anyways. So, you know, I want to, I want people that can see through color or nationality or label and see who I am as a person. And, you know, there is people that have given me hate since I've been on the island, but I don't feel at risk. Yeah. I mean, as far as for me, like I lived in Hawaii and I think Hawaii is a lot like, you know, in, in Hawaii, they call the, the white people Hollies. I mean, I, I remember going to a grocery store once and there was this big sign, you know, it was a massive parking sign at the grocery store that said, no Hallie parking, like we'll be towed on site. And Hallie means without breath. It is the best slur I've ever heard because he, white people have no souls. Yeah. And so I think like to go from, from, you know, Hawaii to, you know, I mean, that was a long time ago. That was in, I think 2009 when I lived there. Um, so maybe it's, you know, it's different now, but, um, you know, when I was there, I was, in my mid twenties, I was like super blonde and most of the, most of the Hawaiians thought I was like European. They all thought I was like from, uh, you know, Switzerland or Sweden or something like that. And so like, they all thought I was European, but like I had uh, one of my friends, Megan, like she's this like little blonde girl. I mean, she got punched out like three or four times in Hawaii. Like they hated her and she was, you know, just a blonde girl from Maine. Um, and I don't, hear any stories like that in in Puerto Rico, you know, you know, like I've, I've seen the protests when I was at my friend's house in, in Condado, you know, the green or go home protest, but I've never felt in danger. You know, I've, I was talking to a, to an older white guy at the grocery store one day and he says he's been here for 20 years and he lived in Hawaii before. And he says now is the closest vibe he's gotten to Hawaii, which is not a, a compliment. He was saying, talking about the tension between, the, the different classes and races. And so, I mean, I hope it doesn't get to, to what, you know, what it's like. And Maui, you know, I think Maui was certainly the worst of the, of the islands. Um, so it's definitely not to that level, but I'm not really too, too sure what's going to be, you know, how it's going to progress. I mean, people like Bianca and, and that, that movement certainly is not going to be beneficial. Well, Marisol, to your point though, I think that is their goal, right? Is mental terrorism right? To make people afraid, to make them feel fearful for their life, to have people be scared. And my response to that, and anytime that's happening is to stand up to it. And I think that's why we we're willing to create this podcast and put ourselves out there because more people should stand up to it and share what the real truth is of the island and not this one-sided narrative. Um, so, I mean, I plan to continue to do so and continue to live my life. Um, I even have my name on Instagram as Spicy Gringo, right? Because Gringo Picante. <laughs> because, you know, I'm not going to just stand there and let people hate on me for something that I haven't done because I'm actually an ally and passionate about the betterment of the island. And I, I just don't believe that this type of speech should be promoted. And I think that people should speak out about it. And I hope more people create content like this as well. Yeah, I think like Alex and I have talked before. I mean, I, th I feel like there's a lot of just regressions, you know, in society. And I think when you are in 2022 and you see a, a gringo go, ho go home movement. I'm not really sure if we're moving forward in society or, or moving backwards. I certainly don't see it as, as progression. I mean, you, you don't want, you're mad for, for being oppressed, but then you go and oppress someone else. I mean, isn't that kind of like you're mad and then you do the same thing that someone allegedly did to you. It seems like, you know, it's just like classic abuser relationship, you know, you get abused so then you become the abuser and you just kind of, perpetuate a cycle that never leads to, to utopia. And you mentioned Jesse racism and, you know, there, there's a historic reality of wealth in the United States and how it has been centralized in the Caucasian race. I'm interested in hearing your take on, is this, about class or is this about race? Because I wonder if it was a community of black investors that moved to 
Puerto Rico if the reaction would be the same? Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, the, in, in the mainland, I mean, the, the richest people are not white people. That's it's a misconception. The richest people are, are Asians. I mean, like the whites aren't even in the top 10. I mean, it's the top 10 is like, you know, 10 different classes of Asian. I mean, everyone just lumps Asians together. But if you're from India and someone's from China, I mean, you're not the same. You know, yeah. the same country, even though you're just it's lumped under, it's under it's Asian, it. right? Or if you're from Japan, or if you're from, you know, Malaysia or Singapore, I mean, you're not, you're not actually, you know, you're Asian, but you're, you're more than that. You're a very specific nation. So, I mean, the gringos aren't even top 10 richest people in America. So I think to, I think it's just right now, I think it's just easy to, to, um, I think, you know, on, on the island, you're just so visible. I mean, if I mean, there's plenty of, other you know mainlanders that have moved over that aren't white that probably don't get the you know the same vitriol just because they're not as visible i mean my you know my uh my fiance is from the philippines and most people think she's puerto rican and the reason i moved to puerto rico was because of her so the reason i moved to puerto rico was because of of uh the girl from the philip you know from the philippines so i think you know from your question i don't really know i think i think it's there's just that stereotype that the white people have the money, but that's not even true anymore. It hasn't been true for, for decades. I do think white people have the power, especially when it comes to politics, right? And on the political side, it's not balanced at all, right? They're, they're working to make it more balanced, but it's not balanced. Um, to be able to change that is a complicated issue. I don't think you can change that with something like affirmative action. You have to change that with people at the grassroots movement running for office. You know, Jesse is not a fan of AOC. I actually am a big fan of AOC. I like a bartender that ran for office because she was passionate about it to be able to make change. Now, has she sold out? Maybe. She's a millionaire already, right? And she's made a lot of money to be able to do it. But I think, you know, she's a great example of a Puerto Rican that left Puerto Rico, went to New York, was struggling as a bartender, ran for office, and now she has made it. And in her mind, she's making a great impact. You know, so um, I think in in political sense, I think it is very, very Caucasian, without a doubt. I mean, to push back a little bit on the wealth concentration, Zuckerberg, Bezos, they are white. Gates, he is Caucasian. Uh, Elon Musk, I know he's from South Africa, but he is Caucasian. So there is a concentration of Caucasian people that tend to have the wealth. And I do see that the hate is probably more due to that than anything else. Because like you said, your fiance, no one could pick her out from any other Puerto Rican in the street. It's just easy to target you all specifically because of how you look. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, you know, like you said, you know, you may, you named, you know, the, the United States of America is what, 320 million Americans. And you named three people, you know, you named Zuckerberg, um, you know, Elon Musk, who's like you said, he's from South Africa is not even from the United States. And so like, I mean, you can name a bunch of other billionaires that are not white, but generally I think they probably just aren't on the, you know, the media circuit, like, um, you know, some of the more famous ones, I mean, especially like Elon Musk. I mean, he's, he's in the news all the time. But I mean, you're, you're talking about two or three people out of 320 million Americans. So to say like, oh, every every person that's white has money. I mean, you can only name a couple examples. I mean, what about the other, you know, how many billionaires are there in the world? I mean, there's about 3,000 now and you named a couple. You can name plenty what? of other billionaires that are not white. Well, yeah, and I understand that, but I think that in America, there is a concentration of wealth in the Caucasian community, and it, it's just due to a historical reality. When you have a race that was enslaved for so long, their gain potential was yeah, but obviously I mean, but statistically, held back for years. Right, but if you go statistically, the Asian, the Asian race has the most wealth in America, not white people. Just statistically, if you go just go to the United, you know, like United States labor statistics, like it's it's not white people don't have the highest concentration of wealth. It's it's the like I said, they're not even in the top ten. Like you can name ten Asian races that have more wealth. 
But I think that there it and that's where we go back to the perception of the colonizer. The idea of an immigrant that comes and makes it is an idea that can be more supportive than the colonizer that has always had the power and that's why they made it. And I'm not necessarily saying that I agree with this, but I can understand people's perspective of why they tend to be infuriated when some people succeed instead of others. But when because they- there's a lot of Asians that live in Puerto Rico and I've never seen this hate over those people that the great majority are business owners. When did the American dream become a a problem and we had to hate people that were wealthy? I mean, every person wakes up every day and works, right? And they would love to be in that situation. To me, it seems more like jealousy than it is actually like feeling that I can do it and taking on victimhood instead of saying, I can be wealthy too. I can move up in my life. You know, my dad, he came from a trailer park, right? Literally didn't graduate high school. My mom was educated, but him and my mom got together. They opened up a business. They put me in a really great situation. It wasn't always great, but it was a really great situation. He was able to class jump. And I think in the situation with Puerto Rico, we're blaming gringos, but it's actually, there's a poverty problem in those videos, right? And there's an education problem and there's an opportunity problem. Um, and so really like leveling up or like class jumping should be something that should be celebrated. Not that we hate billionaires or hate millionaires or hate people that have more than us. We should study it and look at it and celebrate it and say, what did they do? Was it just luck or do they have some type of skill that I can copy and do the exact same thing? Absolutely. And I agree with you, but I think that it's important to highlight that the movement is targeted on people of a certain race because there are plenty, like Mary mentioned, you know, Ricky Martin is very well off and no one's targeting him. Bad Bunny is very well off and no one's targeting him. So mm-hmm. I think it is something to say that specifically the Caucasian community is being targeted for being wealthy, but no one else is. Well, I mean, it's like, you know, like Peter Thiel talks about in, you know, the two books that he wrote, he talks about just being a scapegoat. I mean, the gringos stand out, they're different, just easy to blame. And I think just in society right now, I mean, it's easy to be anti-white. I mean, you see it in, I think, every facet of life right now. I think it's very, it's just kind of like piling on to what's, to what's popular. I don't necessarily know what facts it's based in, but I think it's easy to, to, have a narrative that is popular in the mainstream and everyone jumps on it. And then we're so, you know, we're so visibly different. I mean, like I said, I'm like if my fiance was walking down the street at Filipina, you know, who's Asian, I mean, you would never know she was Asian. You just think she's Puerto Rican. I mean, she looks mm-hmm. almost exactly like you. I mean, like very similar, you know, similar skin tone and hair. And like, you can never tell she was Puerto Rican. I mean, that she wasn't Puerto Rican. You'd be like, oh, yeah, she's Puerto Rican. But, like, when Alex and I walk down the street, it's 100% obvious. And I think that is just, I mean, scapegoats have existed. I mean, what was, you know, during, like, the, when they were the the witch hunt days, you know, like, they were just looking for a scapegoat. Like, oh, you know, this person is going to be the, the fall person. Or, you know, they had child sacrifices back in the day. I mean, I think it's as simple as that. Like, no one wants to take responsibility or a few people do. It's easy to have a victim mentality and it's easy to blame the outsider. I mean, you're an outsider. You're not blaming your own. You blame someone else instead of blaming the government, which is Puerto Rican and blaming the policies that have, that have existed for, for decades. It's easy just to blame someone. I mean, Act 20 has only been around since 2012. You're talking about a decade. Like it hasn't been that long. Like a decade's not long enough time to really have these major problems that are being blamed on the gringos and not to mention most of the gringos didn't come until after Maria. So you're talking less than less than five years. So it's yeah. really, you know, like you can't ever, you can't judge a president for generally what, 10 years after their presidency, because you have to see how their policies actually took effect. So we're not even at the point where we can really even really analyze act 20 with really good, you know, really good uh, data until we, until we get probably another, five five years down the road 
Well, actually, we can because Puerto Rico had the largest debt restructuring in the history of the United States, and they were able to get themselves out of debt. Um, and it was like a $70 billion hole they came out of. And so is it all because of Act 20 and 22 and Act 60? No. Did Act 20, 22, and 60 have an impact on it? Absolutely, right? And, you know, the banking industry left Puerto Rico as a result of that. It's time to bring the banks back, right? It's time to give Puerto Rico the industry that they had before they got into all this debt and there was mismanagement of funds and all the corruption that there was in government. There is a lot of positive impact from Act 2022 and 60, but there needs to be a conversation also about how it's unfair, right? It is 100% only for people that move to the island. And if you're Puerto Rican, you cannot move back and get the same benefits. It has been designed in a way to create a mass migration off the island when for five decades there was already a mass migration and a brain drain off the island. And so it looks like the laws were written in a way to create gentrification. I think that there has to be a way to do it that it's more fair um, to incentivize people that are Bariqua to be able to come back, right? That's a little more sensible, but like you know, Marisol said previously, come back to what, right? Come back to opportunity or come back to problems, right? They're enjoying their life in the mainland right now. Right, but then does that mean like, should like the state of Wisconsin write legislation so I can come back to Wisconsin or you know, my, my friends, I want to go back to where, you know, where they're from. I mean, like a lot of people, they don't move to LA because they want to, they move to LA because it has opportunity. You don't move to the big city because you want to. I mean, most of my friends that live in the big city can't wait till they can move back home, but they have to because of work. I mean, I have two bachelor's degrees and a master's degree. You know, I'm not in Wisconsin because I, there's no job that's going to be able to, you know, align with my, you know, professional degrees and, and pay me what I would make someplace else. So, I mean, I think we're getting into a much like larger issue. I mean, like I said, so, so should Wisconsin be like, yeah, we need to create these programs so we can reverse the brain drain. Yeah. Well, I think the larger issue is that they want us divided and there's a huge issue with nationalism that gets promoted. And there's a huge issue with immigration that gets promoted, but in a global society with what we can do online and the way that we can travel, immigration is only being pushed further. So we have to be comfortable with immigration and comfortable with, um, you know, yes, we have pride in our area, but not so much pride that we hate everybody else. Like if you're doing like Ohio State hates Michigan, that's fine. Okay, that's not a big deal. But when you start hating another human being for the color of their skin or where they come from, now we've crossed into an area that only leads to, you know, major problems. And it's just something that we honestly should be past at 2022. Like we're better than this. I agree with everyone, with everyone's opinion. <laughs> I mean, I think a lot of it just has to do with how we consume media now with the algorithm. I mean, people, it's just an echo chamber. I mean, like I said, I thought, like, like I said earlier today, I think a lot of the discussions nowadays in the mainstream are going in reverse. Like it's a regression, but what gets the clicks, what gets the views. I mean, it's easy to, to talk about the differences. And um, I think maybe people, you know, eat that stuff up instead of just talking about the positives. But I think, I mean, that's just the whole news cycle. Like if it bleeds, it bleeds. I mean, I went to, to radio broadcasting school in 2001, you know, that's, that was always what they said, you know, if it leads, it bleeds. If it, if no one wants to talk about cherries and berries and how everything's great and, I think now it's just that on steroids because of all the the different channels out there on YouTube and Rumble and mm -hmm. with Twitter and people make tweets that they don't even think they're just like, you know, drunk or having a bad day and to say something and then it goes viral and they didn't even mean it, but it just was something that they thought for two seconds and something that they probably never even wanted to say, but that then creates its own new cycle and then you know, it's, it's like Donald Trump. I mean, Donald Trump wasn't even sending his own tweets out. He had a whole a whole team doing it. I mean, they were all calculated. But people are like, oh, like Donald Trump said this at 3 o'clock in the morning. It's like, no, Donald Trump was actually sleeping. It was his team that calculated something out and researched it and thought that was going to get the most traction. And now it's just like trying to out-tweet people and out-viral people, and then it just takes on its own life. So I, I think if we kind of took a step back and just like thought about things logically and, you know, had compassion for people and 
just actually, you know, committed our time to doing real things in life instead of just wasting our time on our phone, we probably would be moving forward instead of backwards. Preach it. Here, I'll give you a short reel that you can use to get a bunch of clickbait. Bianca Gralau is the first colonizer of Puerto Rico. She's the one that's trying to colonize her own people with manipulation and lies. You just put that out there. Everybody's outraged and they're watching our podcast. Yeah, I mean, that's how you do it. You put it at the very end as well. They have to listen to two hours to get to a 30 second sound bite that has nothing to do with the show. I mean, that's exactly how you do it. That, that, wow. We're going to leave with that. Get a thumbnail. Of you. <laughs> Final wrap up here. What's your, your concluding remarks? You know, I want the best for my little island. I don't know right now if statehood or independence is the best, but whatever it is, I think that Puerto Ricans need to put their heads together and work for the well-being of everyone that lives on the island. And wherever the help comes, I think that we should be welcoming of it. Um, there's a lot of hypocritic there's a lot of hypocritical comments that the Gringo Go Home movement have made. Because when Trump wanted to build his wall, a lot of these people said that that wall was inhumane and the border should be open and anyone that wanted to come should come to the U.S. When the same way, anyone that wants to come to Puerto Rico and be of value and contribute should be able to be in Puerto Rico and be there peacefully. And, and uh, yeah, thanks for, for that. And uh, Maria, I mean, we asked Maricel earlier today what, you know, if she was in favor of you know, being becoming independent or becoming part of a, a state in you know, the 51st state, what do you think? I mean, you haven't, you're Puerto Rican as well. So you certainly have a, an opinion. What's your, your thoughts on that? Well, my, my whole life, my family has been like pro state. Let's be 51. Um, I think that we should be a state, but if we decide to be independent, that's good too. I think the status quo is not the right place that Puerto Rico should be. Um, so either or, my preference is state. I love you know, just like I love the organization, the thing, and the um, I want equality, like equality for Puerto Rico. If we if they have that much money for this, we should have the same much money because we support a lot uh, to to the u.s especially in the military like marisol sam you know for the people on the for that don't know i mean if you're a puerto rican you mean you are a u.s citizen so you can oh definitely come yeah. and go from the, to the do you think like let's say puerto rico was a country and you no longer were able to work in the u.s i mean would that be so oh, it's better it would, to be in in my part i will say this with um a little bit of pain in my heart, but if Puerto Rico becomes independent, I think I will go to the mainland, the mainland, and go to Target definitely. <laughs> <laughs> That's the American dream. That's the American dream right there. I'm gonna, I'm gonna buy a Target and make uh, my loft on the top of Target. <laughs> um, that's that's the that's my American dream. But I think it should be one or the other. But if right, it's in then well. Puerto Rico needs to do a lot of work to become independent because we don't have food security here. We don't have a military. We don't have real money to do it. So it, it, it will be a lot of work and it will be hard. But if that's the best thing for Puerto Rico, I think, well... Good luck. <laughs> yeah, did you have anything to say, Marisol? It seemed like you were about to, to say something. So, I didn't so want to... <laughs> this is going to be highly unpopular, but studying the political landscape of the U.S. and just how, you know, representatives are distributed, there's no way in hell Congress is ever going to vote for Puerto Rico to become a state. No. They don't even want Washington, to D.C. to become a state. So I think that the only way Puerto Rico would be absorbed by the U.S. more than what it is right now is if it becomes a municipality or a city or a county of a state. But 
Congress is never going to grant statehood to Puerto Rico. Yeah, I heard once that someone thinks it should be um, a county or a municipality of Florida. And that's a really controversial statement. But they said they, that could work um, because then you would have an integration with a state that is already working with their system and that they would integrate that system here. And that could be a viable solution. But I know that a lot of people would be very upset about it. But that was one idea I heard in the conversation. If it, it isn't, I know that this is not what people that dream of statehood would want, but the reality is Congress does not want to give Puerto Rico two senators and we would have more representatives in the state of Rhode Island because of our population. That's not going to happen, especially because Puerto Ricans are historically aligned with the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. Right. And like you said, Marisol, I mean, what is like if Puerto Rico were to become a state, isn't it more populous than 20 or 22 other states? You'd be you'd be talking about a lot of of um, other congressmen that would be pretty much voted. Out. They'd, they would essentially vote themselves out of a, a position if they were to vote Puerto Rico in. I mean, you I mean you can just go back to the to you know Alaska and Hawaii and see what happened with uh, Congress when they when they became part of the union. And I think, you know, Hawaii became a state because of the military, you know, the you know, advantage there. But in 2022, I mean, they don't, Puerto Rico is not really, the, you know, it doesn't really make any difference in terms of defense. So, well, if you yeah. give it to Puerto Rico, there's five territories like Puerto Rico associated with the U S wouldn't it, you have to give it to the rest as well, like Guam, right. And the other ones, I mean, so that's, that's the thing is like, it would really rock uh, the political spectrum and it would probably would really lean left, you know, so. Well, not necessarily. I honestly don't follow Guamanian politics, so mm -hmm. I don't know if there's an outcry for political equality. Um, I know that D.C. wants to become a state, but like I said, there's severe pushback with that. So why would Puerto Ricans ever think that we would be accepted into the union? Mm -hmm. um, I also heard of someone present the possibility of a 51st state that would be the composition of DC, Puerto Rico, and Guam. That sounds a lot more controversial than Puerto Rico becoming the county of Florida, but I think there's a reality. The union has been for 50 states for over 50 years, and I don't think there's the appetite to adding another state. I mean, just changing the flag, right? That would be a big deal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I just can't see Puerto Rico becoming a state either. I mean, there's so many reasons, like like you it's said. It's just a little dream. Yeah, it's the thing. It's a dream. <laughs> well, it's a dream for some. I mean, like like Marisol saying, definitely not a dream for others, but. Yeah. But yeah, it's. That's why yeah, I, I wanna... that I'm yeah. going to go and live on a Target. <laughs> right. Well, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Marisol, for, for joining us today. Like, it was great to hear your insights and thanks for, for taking the time out to, to join us. Thank you for having me. It was really fun. Mm -hmm.